Fitzgerald, Fraser begins, was the poet laureate of the peculiar blend of eroticism and money-making that epitomised the new era. Despite the free-floating libido and free-flowing cash, it was not a happy picture. But it was not the same picture of moral depravity that for generations was associated with Wall Street. In Gatsby's world, the rich were no longer vicious, but careless, no longer lascivious, but oversated, less devilish than they were cynical, bored, eaten away, and enervated by the enveloping envy of consumer culture. So Gatsby loves and envies Daisy's weightless self-possession. He hates and envies Tom Buchanan's effeminate swagger and supercilious arrogance. The world they toy with, the world Jay Gatsby pants after, is kept aloft by Wall Street. Nick works for Probity Trust, a bastion of Wall Street respectability. Yet like so many, he's irresistibly drawn to Gatsby's underworld, a seductive world of money laundering and trafficking. Nick feels the romance of this illicit capitalism. For Fitzgerald, the market punctuates the era's tragic trajectory. For Steve Fraser then, Wall Street is very much the focus of the great Gatsby. And Fraser is here distinguishing Fitzgerald's perspective from earlier visions of the stock exchange. And as he does so, he's drawing out some interesting parallels between Fitzgerald's period and our own. So he's showing, for example, how in the 1920s, the line between respectable and reckless capitalism grew just as blurred as it did in the years leading up to the banking crisis. At the same time, though, I kind of think Fraser's free reading, if helpful and suggestive, isn't quite as careful as it could be. I'm not sure I'd agree, for example, that Gatsby is quite as capable of hate as Fraser suggests here. To me, at least, he seems too enigmatic, too ethereal, to really properly feel such a visceral emotion. I'm also not sure what I think about Fraser's suggestion that the great Gatsby really marks a movement away from the moral denunciations of Wall Street that had been a familiar feature of previous American generations. A new note of sympathy might indeed appear in the great Gatsby. Fitzgerald, again a little like P.G. Woodhouse, might here depart from previous accounts of the rich by emphasising their pitiful helplessness, their acute lack of independence. But I would argue that a judgement remains. I would argue that a sense of the ultimate immorality of unearned, uh, unearned and spectacular wealth continues to permeate the great Gatsby. But this is to underline Fraser's intriguing phrase, tragic trajectory, which is to say that it's to draw attention to the curiously prophetic quality we find in Gatsby's tragedy. Throughout Fitzgerald's novel, in its every reference to conspicuous consumption, we can hear the clock ticking. Even when the great Gatsby reaches a height of glamour, a brooding and disapproving moral judgment, the simple sense that this affluent scene is wrong and cannot last, continues to make itself felt. The reminder that Nick underlines in his opening chapter that other people haven't had the advantages he had comes to seem increasingly unnecessary as the novel heaps reference on reference to untenable, unjustified wealth. Even when Gatsby is in his pomp, entertaining the New York glitterati, his fraudulence, his deceptions preoccupy the novel, as in this most famous scene. A stout, middle-aged man wheeled excitedly around. What do you think? The books? He nodded. Absolutely real, have pages and everything. I thought they'd be a nice, durable cardboard. Matter of fact, they're absolutely real. Pages and here, let me show you. Taking our scepticism for granted, he rushed to the bookcases. See, he cried triumphantly, it's a bona fide piece of printed matter. It fooled me, it's a triumph. What thoroughness, what realism, knew when to stop too. 
didn't cut the pages. He snatched the book from me and replaced it hastily on its shelf, muttering that if one brick was removed, the whole library was liable to collapse. I think it's hard not to read this scene in terms of moral judgment, even disapproval. Unread, these books are like ornaments, purchased for the status their appearance can confer without consideration of their contents. As such, I would suggest that they are a kind of metonym, a sign that symbolises everything about the house overall, suggesting that it too is too easily acquired, that it's insubstantial and fraudulent, composed of cheap effects. But this is to say that this library exchange hardly constitutes an isolated incident and that it chimes with Nick's opening homily on privilege as well as with the troubled perspective on wealth that we find in the book overall. So consistent is this troubled perspective indeed that we can even begin to forget that The Great Gatsby was written in the years before the Wall Street crash of 1929 and the long depression that followed it. And it's in this judgment, it's in this consistent focus on the unearned and illegitimate quality of these incredible fortunes that I would say that The Great Gatsby not only anticipates our period, the period of the credit crunch, but also reveals its radical cultural difference from it. For even after the credit crunch, let alone before it, we remain without a national epic of the undeserving rich. Alan Hollinghurst has perhaps come closest to providing us with such a thing, but we certainly have nothing of the prophetic and moral status of Fitzgerald's masterpiece. Our culture, instead, continues to fetishise great wealth, to express contempt for affordable commodities, and to suggest that the life of the mega-rich is the only life worth living. At the risk of getting even more preachy, indeed, a comparison of the Great Gatsby and our own period reveals that we have tried to rehabilitate a narrative of the undeserving rich.